All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here at the IP Showcase Theater. And our first speaker is John Myatt with Imagine Communications. And to put a summary on it, John is going to talk about how 21 and 2110 and the NMOS specifications can be used together to make a complete system. John, take it away. Check, 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 check. OK. So uh, as Brad mentioned, I'm John Myatt. I'm going to talk about the full stack. So the first question is, what's a full stack and what's it full of? Um, so in our case, the, the words mean that a full stack is for some domain of use, what are all the requirements on devices and on the environment that they live in, including both what standards they have to follow and what behaviors they should have that maybe are not strictly specified in the standards but are required to make a useful system. So that, because you have to, you know, why do you have to specify all this? The whole goal is that a customer, anybody here a customer? Okay, one. Peter, you're not a customer. So that a customer can take a device, they can take it out of the box, they can hook it up, and with some straightforward workflow, there's another phrase we have to define, they can actually use the device. And as you uh, go about building 2110 systems right now and in setting up the showcase, we've now set up a lot of 2110 products. They all involve a certain amount of typing and configuring and so forth to make them work. And compared to something like, say, an SDI camera, where you just take it out of the box, you kind of pick your white balance and your temperature and a couple other camera-related things, you plug it in and you get a picture. In 2110 by itself, that's a bit harder. So the goal of the suite of standards we've been working on, 2110, ISO 4, ISO 5, so forth, is to make a complete system. The full stack really is the definition of that complete system. So we've just rattled a bunch of terms that we're going to have to define, right? So we're going to have to define domain of use. What domain of use do we shoot for? Um, what do we mean by devices and environments? What do we mean by standards and behaviors? And of course, what is that ethereal straightforward workflow? Because, you know, maybe it won't just work, but it better be close to just working. It better be reasonable. So what's domain of use? Well, the domain of use we're talking about in this full stack is devices that, you know, well, that, you know, we're going to use 2110, we're going to use AMA, blah, blah, blah. The specific type of use, for at least the purpose of my talk here, is engineered facilities, either fixed or mobile, but facilities that are designed. So not, oh, on a workbench I want to plug a thing into a thing, but an engineered facility. Um, typically making television or radio content, producing or distributing or packaging, and built around this set of technologies. You know, this is not a full stack that would do uh, some other, you know, some other thing. This is specifically the 2110 ISO 45 full stack. Okay, that's our domain of use. Um, devices. Well, devices are things that create and consume 2110 streams. That's pretty straightforward. The environment is interesting because, you know, my company, we make devices. So the device comes out of the box. It lives in an environment. What assumptions can that device make about the environment? So the environment is the management and data networks that I attach to. And management services, so protocol services or whatever, that I can expect to exist in that network. So when I am plugged onto the customer's network and I wake up, what services can I expect to find and make conditions of this straightforward workflow? And then, of course, the straightforward workflow is also interesting because you say, well, is there a human in the loop? So if I take a new thing and I just plug it in, should it just work? Or do I, as a human, need to do something? And so I think it's OK for a human have to, to have to do something for two reasons. One is to authenticate the device to say, yes, I expected that device, or wow, what is that? I better go find who plugged what in that I didn't know about, because that's an important thing. 
And the second is that typically a new device does not have its production name that makes sense in your facility. So you plug it in, it's going to have some default name. You probably want to assign it a real name that means something in your facility. So those two things mean there's at least a little bit of human touch, but that human touch ought to be reasonable. It should not, in particular, require a lot of engineering knowledge for you to add a device. It should require you to say, I expected this device, and here's what it's called in my plant. If we can get down to it just being that, we'll be in really good shape. OK, so standards, behaviors. Well, the standards we've said a million times. SMPTE 2110, 1020, 2130, 31, and 40. They're done. They're published. Every one of those documents is now published. Um, AMWA ISO 4 and AMWA 5 are both stable AMWA specifications. If someone tells you they're waiting for those all things to be finished, no, no, the documents are finished. Their implementation might not be finished, that's a different question. But somebody who tells you, oh, those documents aren't done, they're done. Um, IEEE 802.1AB, boy, most people don't know what that is, but that's a general Ethernet thing. It's usually called LLDP by the rest of us. And it's also very useful because it's how the network detects what's plugged around it. And there's places where that's very, very helpful. Um, it's also typical. It's in the standard Windows kernel. It's in the standard Linux kernel. It's in most things already. Every switch speaks it. You didn't even know it was happening, but we're starting to depend on it in these networks for finding out the real connectivity of devices. And then each of these standards tends to be a very flexible document that's designed to cover a lot of use cases. So for this particular domain of use, we may want to have additional constraints that say, if you're using you know, 2059 in this domain of use, you're going to use it this way that's maybe more narrow. Now, behaviors. OK, so this is device-centric, but how does a device know its network information, its host address, its cedar, gate, its cedar mask, its gateways? You know, how does it do it? Well, you have to type them all in, of course. Hopefully not, right? How does a device know that it's waking up after a power cycle because you went over and, you know, power cycled it to do something? Maybe you had to move it. How does a device differentiate that case from you just bought it from a rent, you know, rented it from a rental company and it still has all the settings of the last person who used it? Those are very different cases the device has to have some way to figure out the difference between them because there might be a behavior that's related to that. In particular, it has to do with those settings. And should I come up and transmit in my last known settings, which if you just you know, power cycle the device, it probably should. Or should I wait to be told because I'm in a new environment and I don't want to step on other streams necessarily? Um, how do I as a device, or how does a device know the prevailing PTP settings? because there's settings it needs to know to participate in the PTP network. How does a device find the ISO 4 registry? How does it know what timeout value that registry is set to? Because again, those are parameters of the system that the device has to know to function properly. And of course, in the end, how does a device know what multicast addresses it should wake up and run on? Because having two things on the same multicast address is a mistake that'll take you an hour to find necessarily. So all that said, these are the standards and behaviors that we have to, the full stack has to solve. The full stack has to describe the answers to these questions. And I'm not here to say what the answers are, but I have suggestions of what the answers might be for some of these. Um, the standards are pretty much done, right? Like we said, anybody who tells you that they're not done, they're, they're just messing with you. 2110 is done. ISO 4 and 5 are done. Did I mention that they're done? Domain, environment, devices, workflows, those were reasonable definitions. I mean, you could, you could pencil in a lot more words and make them more specific, but I think they're OK. These behaviors, well, that's what we're going to talk about next. So first behavior, how to find your network details. Thankfully, the internet world has solved this problem for us. When you walked into this room, if you had the Wi-Fi password, your phone would have woken up, connected to the Wi-Fi, everything would be good, because you used DHCP. 
the dynamic host configuration protocol. It's what most things use. Um, it's well supported. It works at scale. Um, when my neighborhood has a power failure and then everyone's house comes back online, everybody's modem does a DHCP request and some computer at Verizon goes gulp and then suddenly everyone has a DHCP address again. DHCP works at scale. It's well supported. Every switch and router that you buy just about has a DHCP server or more appropriately has a, what's called a DHCP helper that then connects to a big DHCP server. Um, DHCP itself is not inherently secure. It's a fairly old protocol. But there's things you can do in the network design to make it quite robust. Um, you can you know, set some ACLs so that devices can't pretend to be a DHCP server so that the only one that's really accessible is the one inside the switch, you know, things like that. Um, there's pretty widespread agreement in the world that DHCP is a reasonable choice for how devices wake up. Now remember that typically these devices have at least two media network interfaces, main and protect, and many things have a separate management interface, so really it's DHCP on all three of those finding the addresses separately on each one. And again, that's okay. They can all back into the same DHCP server at the, at the, in the network, but each interface has a DHCP address. If you don't do DHCP, you've got to configure this stuff manually, and done it a lot, it's, you know, that, that's where you get the big spreadsheet full of addresses. Okay, how about this fresh start versus restart? Say I'm a device, I just powered up, do I light up with the last settings I had, which, by the way, as a television equipment manufacturer, I'll tell you, that's a line item requirement in every RFP from every customer is that I light up with the last settings I had. But if I'm a new box from a rental company, or maybe I'm a demo gear box that just came from the vendor so I could try it out, I may not want it to light up with the last settings it had. So how does the device, how can we make the devices understand the distinction? Well, it would be really helpful, right, if the devices could tell new environment from last environment I lived in. And one way to do it would be to have some kind of system good, some kind of system unique ID that when the device wakes up and it, you know, gets its information about the world, that it could find one more piece of information, which is this global ID. So I can tell if I'm in, you know, the maintenance shed or if I'm in the real facility or if I'm on the rental truck or if I just came out of the box and it's a new world. So that's not a hard thing to do. We just have to have a way that the device can wake up and know, you know, am I in Kansas or not? Okay, the prevailing PTP parameters. Here's another interesting tidbit. PTP has a domain number. How do you know what domain number is going on in the facility you just woke up in? Every device, you have to know it. Now, we could just have a default. We could just say, we will have a default. Everybody will use domain 37. That's just how we roll. But, you know, there's reasons that might not be great, too. Like, you, you might have a facility where you have two different time bases, or you might have a facility where you just, for whatever technical reason, need to use a different domain. Um, so you have to distribute this information. Somehow the device has to know it in order to function properly. Now, in addition, if you have main and protect network interfaces on the media side, you need to do the equivalent of the best master clock algorithm across those two interfaces, which means that even if you're a slave-only device, you actually have to know the announce interval and the announce timeout as just part of the algorithm. So how do you learn those? Well, somebody's got to tell you. So there's, here's another, you know, so you're making this little list of if I was configuring by hand, what are all the things I would have to type in to wake up this device? Here's three more things on that list. Okay, so again, in the full stack, we have to have a way that devices learn that information or a ironclad set of defaults that we're going to just assume everybody's going to wake up with those defaults. And of course, the trouble with defaults is if the last guy that used the device set it differently, it's not on that default anymore, and then you're going to have to discover that the hard way. Okay, how do I find the ISO 4 registry? Well, the ISO 4 registry specifies MDNS or DNS service discovery for finding the registry. So 
MDNS is local subnet specific. So there's some network architectures where that's not practical because there's some network architectures where there's a lot of separate layer three zones and the MDNS doesn't just hop across those. So you get into using MDNS helpers or some other mechanism that can complicate the network. Um, DNS service discovery through unicast DNS absolutely can work. And that may be the way we settle on ultimately. Um, it does add the fact that now the redundant DNS servers are another piece of critical infrastructure. But, you know, you've got switches, you've got the DHCP servers. That, that's not necessarily a burden to have redundant DNS servers as well. It's, most enterprises will have redundant DNS, but it does introduce a requirement. So is there some other way, you know, could we just make people type in the registry ID? Well, we're trying to avoid that typing, right? So this list of information, one possibility would be to say, why don't we use DHCP vendor information? Now, this is not a widely supported idea. This is a John thing. So I say that right away. So Peter doesn't have to yell at me and say, John, no one else agrees with you, which is true. Um, but it is an interesting idea to say, you know, we could use this. Now, it turns out we're not the first industry to have this problem. So if you look at the wireless access points that are hanging all over the Rye, how do they wake up and find their configuration server? Oh, it's sent out to them as a DHCP vendor-specific parameter. If you look at your DOCSIS cable modem, I don't know if that's a European standard, but in the U.S., that's how cable modems work. The DOCSIS cable modems, they wake up, they DHCP back to the DHCP server, and the DHCP server, in addition to giving them an IP address, gives them a bunch of other information about what channel they're on and things like that, and that's how they proceed to do their job. So these things have been proven to work at scale, that the DHCP server can serve out an enterprise-specific blob. So to do that, RFC 3925 tells you everything you need to know. Well, no, it tells you something, and then you have to figure out the rest. But it lets you ask for it lets you advertise a vendor ID. Now, the thing that makes this hard, and the reason we have to do this way, is that Windows, God bless them, when you boot up your Microsoft computer, it registers itself in DHCP with a vendor ID of Microsoft. And that's hard-coded in Windows. There's no way to change it. Well, you can replace the DLL with one you patched, but there's really no practical way to change it. So RFC 3925 lets you have multiple vendor IDs, because really you might want to say, well, I'm a Windows computer, but I'm running this application and this application and this application, and each of those might actually need different vendor parameters. So there is a mechanism for this, and it's pretty well trodden by other, app other industries. So to use it, we would need to register an IANA Enterprise ID, maybe for AMWA. I suspect AMWA has one, actually. And then that becomes the tag that says, okay, this is an AMWA information blob, and then we have to define all the pieces. And there's sub-IDs in there that could carry a PTP and, you know, PTP domain, announced timeout, sync interval, global system ID, and so forth, and potentially the registry list. Although, as we mentioned, the registry information you can find in DNS, and the DNS IDs you got through DHCP anyway. So then there's multicast addresses. This is probably really the biggest problem. Because, you know, that other information, there were only maybe 10 items we rattled off that you have to know to start up. But multicast addresses, every stream's got one. This is work. So the current practice in every customer I've installed a system at is that they have a pattern and a geographic thing, and they say, okay, I want to manually allocate these lists in some way that reflects my facility. So if it's 239.107, it's coming from that room. If it's 239.108, it's coming from that room, or some kind of you know, allocation pattern like that. But then there is a thing called MADCAP. It's, a, it's an RFC number that starts with a 2, which tell you that it's from a long time ago. Um, we looked at that. I think, you know, like Peter's shaking his head. Other people are, yeah. We, I think we all read that with the excitement of, oh, we could use this, and then finished reading it and said, ah, it's not great. So that's, we aren't using MADCAP because it just doesn't kind of do the job. Um, ISO 5, the standard that's finished, describes a mechanism where the controller can patch a device, can tell a sending device, use these addresses. But... Nowhere does it really anywhere say 
that a device has to support that. A device can advertise its capability as my addresses are this and you can't change them. So that's fine, the standard is fine, but as a behavior in this full stack, we probably have to document that devices, particularly sending devices, need to allow ISO 5 to patch their addresses so that ISO 5 controllers can set those addresses according to some global scheme in a given facility. Now, remember that we also, on the second behavior, talked about how do I know if I'm waking up in a new facility versus waking up in the same facility I was in two minutes ago. So you couple those things together and then put the allocation problem up into the control system. Now you have a way to bootstrap a device in a system. Now, how do we move this forward, right? Because this is all neat, but it's not universally agreed by everybody, but it could be. I think there's a reasonable locus of how to move forward. So first we have to figure out, you know, there are a number of organizations that are involved in the Joint Task Force on Network Media. There's the AMWA, SMPD, BSF, EBU, AES. I'm looking for across the top of the wall there pretty much, right? So we have to figure out one or more of those organizations it, we need to actually move a document through. That's not as hard as it sounds. Um, I did volunteer to draft and edit such a thing, and I'm happy to do it, but we do have to have a forum where we drive compromise and agreement on a couple of technical points, get the gavel, and be done. I think that's a goal that we all share to get something like this absolutely ironed out and agreed. And it's time. Um, as an industry, I think everyone agrees that it has to happen. There's plenty of proponents. I don't think anyone is saying that we shouldn't do this. We'll probably need to have a couple of interop events to really iron out the, you know, have, have a clean room where you bring in your box, you plug it in, and you have that, you know, simple human workflow to set a name, and then you're done, right? Good thing we're good at these interop events. But the time has come to do something like this. So, any magic questions? That's the end of my slides, and I have six minutes left. Oof. Do we have any questions for John? Someone will ask a question. Someone. I have a question. I, I knew you would because you came prepped. How many customers are you talking to that really see this as a, a, a mandatory requirement going forward to build real systems? Um, it, every customer RFP that I see asks about ISO 4, ISO 5, 2110. Um, and if this had a name and a number they could refer to, they would list it, absolutely. But that's what this full stack proposal ultimately needs is a name and a number that can be part of a bid spec. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that the, the, one of the things that we learned just in putting this interop together here, and we had uh, almost 60 different vendors participating in this, over 150 IP addresses uh, associated with this. Oh, oh those uh, are just host addresses. And there's, those are just host that, addresses. You count the right. audio channels, there's thousands of multicast groups in this room. A absolutely. And <laughs> just the setup of that was a massive undertaking, and this is nowhere near the sort of size of facility you would have in any typical European or uh, anywhere. UK, anywhere, US broadcaster. So um, it, it really is, I think, a matter whether it, it's being actively asked for right now or not. Mm. I think anyone who's worked in an IP environment and tried to set up any kind of a even moderate sized uh, facility knows that trying to run it off of spreadsheets uh, or yellow tablets or something is completely impractical, yeah. especially and, in an ongoing yeah. facility. And what I see in RFPs right now is actually customers have sort of the list of those questions and their ideas of how it ought to work, but we have the risk that each individual broadcaster is coming up with a slightly different way they wish it would work, and, and that will lead us all to ruin. So as a standards community, we have to get ahead of that and write something down and then everyone can just refer to it. So yeah. it's not about making a hard way or an easy way, it's about making an official way quickly. 
Absolutely. I think in the partnership between uh, the organizations in the JTNM and with Ames and so on, yeah. I think we have the, the right people in the room with the right kind of uh, definitions of different work areas to tackle this. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, m my personal opinion, we should get started on this sooner rather than later because you can absolutely see the demand coming. Yep. Pete, um, you had a question. Uh, Bob, can you take this for Pete? So as a representative, representative of a, cust cust a customer, let's say, um, who's, who's building a big IP uh, facility in, uh, in Wales, um, this is extremely important. I mean, we, we, we all, that team is very keen to have this happen because uh, they need those missing bits okay. building. Uh, on, mic up 45 yeah, sure, degrees. Sure, sure, yeah, sure, there you go. Sure. Um, also, we're also working within the EBU on, this, on, the, on the requirement side. So one thing that has come up a few times is, uh, and that will be relevant to the, uh, some, of the, some of the presentations later, is the area of security, mm -hmm. of securing IP streams. How much should we engage with that in this particular work, do you think? Obviously, well, you know, I, I've is, it a big, is it too big a can of worms? Well, I think... Does, does If the security system requires the device to have a token or a key or a certificate or something, then you'll wind up with needing a way for the device to bootstrap that. And so if something has to be passed to the device, you know, DHCP is a way to do it. It's a, there's other ways, but they're all, you know, somehow if the security schema requires the device to have a certificate or have a something, then we've got to have a way to get it. And whatever that path, whatever path we work out, we should definitely be able to communicate one more thing. But I'm going to ask back to you, does, is the securitization system going to require the device to have a, a certificate or something like it? And I don't know if we know yet, but TBD? Okay. Any other questions?